Hey, good morning, friends. Sunday morning, nine o'clock. Podcast time with Brother Mike. Welcome to the deep things of God. And uh, thank you for tuning in today. Um, if you need to get a hold of me, uh, you can do that pretty easily. You send me an email. Mike at hardcorechristianity.com. If you happen to be uh, living in the Phoenix area, you can give the ministry line a call if you want to, 602-636-5800. And uh, you can uh, come to one of our live services every week, Thursdays and Friday nights at uh, 7 o'clock at the Arizona Deliverance Center. We also provide uh, free counseling services for born-again Christians. Call the ministry number. 602-636-5800, and you're there. We'll schedule you for uh, for an appointment. In particular, if you're uh, a Christian, a born-again Christian, you're a military veteran, you're struggling with PTSD. If you are uh, a Christian and you're struggling with uh, transgenderism uh, or having suicide thoughts, please call right away. I'll get you in as quickly as I can because you are a very loved person, extremely so. And uh, God wants to help you and he wants to heal you. There's no question about it. I have personally seen several thousand people delivered from demons and several hundred people physically healed right in front of my eyes. So it happens all the time. If you want to hear about some of the testimonies, you can catch uh, my Facebook group. It's called Blessings, B-L-E-S-S-I-N-G-S. And I put up a lot uh, a lot of the testimonies and uh, stories of the people that have been healed. So it's right on that Facebook group. And uh, the people that have uh, been healed that have sent me uh, testimonials, emails, and so on. That's on the website. If you go to the website, hardcorechristianity.com, and if you hit the testimonial button there at the top, boom, you're there. And uh, you can read their story, and it's probably similar to yours. And their healing will also be similar to yours. (laughs) You're going to get healed too, period. (laughs) Period. That's how this thing works. Hey, I want to share a couple of interesting things with you today. Um, Let me read a couple of scriptures to you that uh, were absolutely fascinating that Jesus said. Says the disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. That's Matthew chapter 10. And um, the Greek word for disciple there is mathetes. A mathetes is someone who is a eager, anxious learner, somebody who learns. Okay. And um, the Greek word for master there is didaskalos. It's the Greek word for being a teacher. So Jesus is really saying, saying here, a student is really not above their teacher, nor a a servant above his Lord. Greek word for servant there is doulos. It means a slave, a slave. Um, A slave is not above his Lord. As you know, uh, back in the early church times, uh, it was common for people to have slaves uh, all through civilization from day one, practically. Um, slavery has been an unfortunate part of humanity. Two types of slaves, of course, physical slaves and the slavery of sin. Either one of those, Satan is behind both of them. And what he's saying here is that in, as a Christian, it's not like the natural world. In the natural world, this is not true. Many times uh, a teacher is surpassed by their students 
It happens all the time. You know, you got a trainer at a gym uh, training someone who later on becomes a professional athlete. You can have, uh, you could be a professor at a medical school training students who later on go on to win the Nobel Prize or something. But in the spirit world, in the spirit world, in Christianity, it is not possible. It is not possible for you and I as students to be greater than our teacher, the Lord Jesus. Matthew chapter 10 also says, it is enough for the disciple that he is, that he is as his master. And it is enough if the servant is as his Lord. And Jesus said, if they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? And here you see the crux of Christianity hitting us in the face here. Extremely hard. Extremely hard. That if you're one, if you want to be a servant and you want to be a disciple, your goal is to be as your master. You'll never be greater than your master. What was your master like? What, what was your teacher like? Well, being a disciple is it's sometimes not a very pleasant thing. Uh, for example, Jesus was the um, least self-absorbed human being that ever lived. His entire life was one of servanthood. And he made major sacrifices to fulfill his mission in serving his heavenly father. For example, he got up early every morning and spent time in prayer. He spent enormous time fasting before he faced Satan in the wilderness. Uh, he made enormous sacrifices as a servant of Jehovah. And to fulfill his mission that Isaiah outlined in numerous scriptures, he had to be a non-absorbed, self-absorbed person. And, you know, as Brother Paul said, in the latter times, perilous times will come where men will be lovers of them, their own selves. The Greek word for perilous there in that verse is kalipus, and it means dangerous. In the latter days, dangerous times are going to come. And we're starting to see that here in America with advent of satanic wokeism. Um, you can't just have an opinion anymore in America. You have to be shut down. You have to shut up. And you have to be punished. You have to be taken out. You have to be removed. You have to be canceled. Dangerous times are ahead of us here in the United States, believe it or not. Our country's changing rapidly. It's changing quickly. And they're going to come after everything we have. It's only a matter of time. And with the advent of artificial intelligence, you can see now clearly how, in the book of Revelation, how the Antichrist can take over the planet. Fifty years ago, nobody had any idea how the Antichrist could take over the planet. It didn't make any sense at all. There was no concept of it. There was no way it could have happened. But with the advent of the Internet and social media and artificial intelligence, you're kidding me. I mean, this is just right around the corner. It's, there's no way to stop it. There's no way to stop it. Your job in life is to be as your master, someone who is not focusing on self. 
Luke chapter 6 says, quote, Jesus said, the disciple is not above his master, and everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. Now, that Greek word for perfect in that verse in Luke 6, katartizo, means uh, someone who, uh, something that it's in the process of being developed. It goes back to the potter's wheel. You take the clay, clump of clay, then you start molding it, then you mold it some more, then you mold it more, and more, you mold it more. And there you go. And at the end, katartizo, voila perfection. It's a process of being groomed, trained, developed. And that's that's the process you're in right now. And in order to get in that process, you have to be very patient with yourself and very patient with others and very, very, very patient with God. Because the Holy Spirit um, I hate to say it, I don't mean to be negative, but kind of gets on our nerves because uh, you and I would prefer that he speed it up and get to the point, get it done, get it over with, and move on to the next thing. And uh, he won't do that. He won't do that. He just keeps moving forward. And he doesn't rush what he needs to do with your life. And so in order to fulfill your destiny and your call from God, you got to be very patient. You have to be very patient. Patience possesses your soul. And the key to being a servant, the Greek, the uh, King James Version uses the term perfect. That's not a good term for that verse. Katartizo is not, you're not perfect, you're fully developed is what that means. Everyone that is fully developed will be as his teacher. Translation, you will never be superior to Jesus uh, in anything. We'll We'll never be there. Our goal in life is to be there but it will never actually happen. No one can be equal to or greater than Jesus. But our goal is to be as our teacher because we are disciples, mathetes, students, and learners of the living Christ. I had a verse that I read many, many, many years ago, not long after I had turned my life over to the Lord. This verse in John, you probably have it memorized. Almost everybody does. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say to you, he that believes on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do. Because I go to my Father, and whatever you ask in my name, that will I do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. That verse always bothered me. You know what? Did it ever bother you? I mean, I struggled with that verse for years. And to be honest, I kind of dismissed it in a way. I, I didn't even think of it much because I just just could not figure it out to make any sense. And then I realized that I was taking verses out of context when I first learned to study the scriptures. And I came out of the Assemblies of God religion, and I had a little um, 
I still had a little of that word of faith stuff in me. And the word of faith uh, teachings are very damaging at times because they pull a verse out and then you use the verse. But unfortunately, the verse in every instance uh, is, is contextually valuable. You have to take the verse in context. Okay. And the context of that verse was that Jesus was explaining that he was in the Father and the Father was in him. And that everything he taught and everything he did was not just from him. It was the Father working through him. And that the works that he was doing, all of his works, were to demonstrate that he was in the Father and the Father was in him. And that verse at John 14 said, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do. Also, the Greek word for believe there is pistuo, and it's a Greek verb, which means to have active faith. It means to have faith, which is the Greek word pistis, and it means to put your faith in action. Like preachers say, stepping out on your faith. He that is stepping out on their faith on me, he that believes on me, he that is doing faith activities, he says, the works that I do shall he do also. The Greek word for do there is poieo. It means to practice. And it's a Greek verb in the present continuous tense. That means that someone who is actively stepping out on their faith and is practicing the works of Christ, they will practice his works because they're stepping out on their faith. And it says, greater works than these shall he do because I go to my father. And whatever you ask in my name, that will I do. What he's talking about there is, the Greek word is mizon. It means bigger, larger, more massive works will they do. And he wasn't saying that you and I can do greater personal miracles than Jesus did. That's not what he's saying. Okay, nobody can do greater miracles than the Lord Jesus. Nobody can do that. You, he was in a boat one day after he had been walking on the water in the middle of a storm, and suddenly the boat was teleported to shore in the, in the middle of a storm. Okay, <laughs> okay that's, that's a tough miracle to replicate. Uh, Lazarus had been in the tomb and had been dead for four days. And the reason that he had been dead for four days, because it was a Jewish tradition and a belief among Jews that the spirit stayed with or near the body for three days. For three days, the spirit would stay near the body. And so Jesus didn't go back to raise Lazarus for four days because he wanted that testimony because the Jews knew that on the fourth day, the person started to decompose and they believed, their personal belief was that the spirit was gone now, that it, that it had gone to its eternal home. And so the miracle was far greater far greater than anybody imagined. Okay, nobody 
none of us are ever going to uh, be just like Jesus. That's not going to happen. Okay, it can't. It can't happen. It can't happen. If you look at John chapter three, uh, the great John the Baptist, the greatest preacher that ever lived said that God gives him not the spirit by measure. That means that Jesus had the Holy Ghost without measure, without a limitation. Okay, that's that's never happened before Jesus. That's never happened after Jesus. No one has ever had the Holy Ghost without measure, without a limitation. That's insane to have that kind of an anointing. That's why you read through the four Gospels, and everybody that wanted to get healed got healed. Everybody got delivered. Everybody got a miracle. It was one after the other. There was never a failure. Of course, people that didn't believe, like the people in Nazareth, no, they didn't get any miracles. But the point is, everybody that wanted a miracle, that came for a miracle, went home with a miracle, 10 out of 10, 100 out of 100, 10,000 out of 10,000. That's the Holy Ghost without measure. You and I are never going to have that because we're not able to sacrifice our lives to be as exactly as our teacher, which Jesus was. He became just exactly as Jehovah. And that's our goal. That's what he's saying here. It is sufficient for you to become as your master. But there's major sacrifices that have to be made there. Prayer, servanthood, persecution, dedication, self-denial. Jesus was the master teacher in all of these areas. And if you're going to be a disciple, It's everyone that is perfect, Katertizo, shall be as his master. And that's our goal. We want to get as close as we can to being like Jesus as we possibly can. As close as we can get to it. That's our goal. And because the Holy Ghost's power is so enormously, ridiculously strong, People who have only a small anointing from the Spirit of God can accomplish enormously valuable and powerful things. You don't have to have a truckload of the manifest presence of the Holy Ghost to see miracles. No, he, with his kind of power, bang, you're in. Philippians chapter 2 says something real interesting about Jesus. It was fascinating. He said, Jesus made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. The Greek word there, believe it or not, is doulos. It means a slave. It's the, the, the miracle of Christ's life was that he came from glory as God and became a human being says he was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death on the cross. And because of that, it says, God has highly exalted him and given him a name above every name. That process right there, is exactly what's going to happen to you and I if you choose to be a slave. A doulos is a slave, and slaves don't ask questions. They know what to do. They were told what to do, and they just obey. They obey. And that's what Jesus did. His entire life was spent Obeying Father, sacrificing everything for Father's will. And you and I, if we want to be a disciple, not just a Christian, but a disciple, 
we got to do the same thing. We have to keep pressing toward the goal, the mark, the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Servanthood, slavery, is your goal. When you and I were living in sin, hey, sin was our slave master, and we were the slave. We were a slave to sin. We sinned by nature. We sinned normally. It was part of our nature. You know, we were leopards, and we had spots. Why? Because we were leopards. We kept sinning. Why? Because we were sinners. That was our nature. That's who we were. We were built to do that. We did it naturally, like breathing. We just kept sinning. Now, your goal is no longer to satisfy yourself or be a self-absorbed person. Your entire goal now is to be a doulos, a slave. A slave like Jesus. He became a slave. And if you do that in Revelation, the Bible says, and you become an overcomer, Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, you get a brand new name and glory. You get enormous rewards in heaven. You become a ruler on earth during the millennial, after the second coming. You become a leader in the new world order when Christ comes back. It's it's the same process Jesus went through. He sacrificed everything about his life and became a slave to Father. And then he said, as my Father sent me, now I am sending you. As Jesus did everything in the name of Jehovah or Yahweh, Yehovah, now you and I do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, Yahshua. Yeshua, and so on. And we are to make ourselves of no reputation, and we are to take on ourselves the form of a doulos, a slave. That's our job, to become a slave. Slaves don't run the show. Slaves take orders. Slaves follow orders. And The key to losing an opportunity to be a slave is rebellion. Like that movie Gladiators. You know, rebellion. And when we get involved in rebellion, as you know, that draws in witchcraft spirits because witchcraft demons are control freaks and they want to dominate everything that goes on. And that's what happens when you're You lose your capacity to not to start living for yourself because then you want to, you're no longer a slave. You're no longer a servant. You're now a self-absorbed person and God cannot trust you with the anointing of the spirit and the power of the spirit and the gifts of the spirit. And you start to lose the fruit of the spirit You start to grieve the Holy Spirit, and then you start to quench the Holy Spirit in your life. The Greek word for quench there in that verse is sabinami. It means to extinguish, like you would light a match and put it out. That's what happens to your fruit of the Spirit. That's what happens to your anointing when you become a self-absorbed Christian. It's a disaster that's hard to describe. And it says in John chapter 12, Verily I say to you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it will remain alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. Of course, he's talking about himself. And by extension, he's talking about you. Paul said it, I die daily. This body of yours is the biggest enemy you're ever going to face because your body is in rebellion 
Your body wants what it wants when it wants it. I want it now. That's how you were raised as a child. Children are born, one-year-old, two-year-old, three-year-old. I want it now. And Jesus would not allow that with his body. Paul said, I beat my body and bring it into subjection, lest having preached to others, I would become a castaway. A castaway is uh, the Greek word adakamus. It means a reprobate. Unless I, w- I would become a, a reprobate. That's a pretty serious statement that Paul had a fear and a concept that that could happen if his body got out of control and started to control him. And that's what your body does. It gets out of control. It falls in love with people you shouldn't fall in love with. It has sexual desires for people you should not have desires for. It wants food and lots of food that you should not be eating. Your body is a problem. It's a problem. But slaves, dulos, they sacrifice their bodies for their masters, for the slave owners. Their bodies are in service to others. That's why that Greek word doulos is used so often in the text about being a servant. And Jesus goes on and says, if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. He that loves his life will lose it. Translation, a self-absorbed person will lose their destiny and their call from God. Because a self-absorbed person cannot be a servant, a doulos, by definition. Because a doulos is not, by definition, a self-absorbed person. A slave works for somebody else. And Jesus said, how do you do that? How, how do you how do you accomplish what I just said? How do you die? How do you not love your life so you won't lose it? Well, he says it right here. He that hates his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. And if any man wants to serve me, Jesus said, let him follow me. For where I am, there shall also my servant be. And if any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now, in this section of text, it's really interesting because doulos is not used in this section of text. It's the Greek word diakonos. And diakonos is the term you would use if you were going to describe somebody who was a waiter in a restaurant. Have you ever gone out for a nice meal? I used to do that all the time when I had a lot of money, but now I don't don't have a lot of money anymore. Things changed for me in 2008 during the crash. That's, that's when I lost lost all my money. I'm, I was a millionaire back then. I'm not now. But I I had been out to nice restaurants, and you know the waiter comes and they're wearing a nice outfit and they're taking your order and bringing the drinks and so on. Everybody knows what that is. That's a diaconus. You know what? And that's what you're supposed to be doing. You're supposed to be waiting on the Lord. That's your job in life. That's your job in life. You're supposed to be waiting on the Lord. If you get involved with witchcraft, or sorcery, or spiritualism, or New Age, Familiar spirits are behind all of those things. It's all run by familiar spirits. And the real danger of familiar spirits is they are control freaks. They want you to be their slave. And they want you to think the way they think and do what they tell you to do, period. And if you don't do it, 
you're going to pay a severe price for it. You're going to take a whipping. You're not going to believe. You've seen these palm readers, right? Psychics. They're on TV. They're on, you know, the internet. There's the association of psychics. You call that association, they'll get you in touch with a psychic in your area. These psychics don't understand that they're infected with familiar spirits and that the, the demons are blessing them temporarily. Have you ever followed an old psychic? Have you ever met an old one? Like in their 70s or something? They are shot. They are physically ill. They got all kinds of sicknesses. They got massive joint problems. They have chronic pain issues like you can't believe. And the reason for that is familiar spirits turn you into a slave and they temporarily bless your work, but then they want to get paid. And the way they get paid is through pain. Pain is their pain. Pain is their visa card. Pain is MasterCard. They'll give you something. They'll give you the ability to read palms, uh, tarot cards, predict the future. But then they're, they're going to want to get paid, paid, and they get paid with pain. Okay? Right now, for example, uh, Bethel Church in California and several like it in the prophetic movement. They're now starting to use spiritualism to help people. They've got their own brand of tarot cards now. They've got all kinds of strange spiritual uh, services they provide. There's going to be numerous people in the prophetic movement dying of cancer. Uh, they're going to have prophetic ministers coming down with terminal illnesses left and right. And everybody in the world's going to be praying for them. And they're not going to get healed. They're going to die sick. Anytime you have anything to do with familiar spirits, they will bless you temporarily. They'll give you power. And then you're dead. Then you've got to pay it back. Okay? If you look in the book of Revelation, the greatest uh, Satanist in the history of the world is the false prophet. He has more power. Uh, than any man that's ever lived, even Nimrod, satanic power. He, he dedicates his life to serving Satan. The Bible says he, he receives Satan's power. He sets the Antichrist up. He causes people to worship the Antichrist. He sets up the system where the Antichrist takes complete, complete command. This is the most dangerous spiritual person that ever walked the face of the earth. The most dangerous man that ever lived since Nimrod. Guess what happens to him? <laughs> he gets thrown in the lake of fire. The familiar spirits always get paid back when they give you something. You have to be their slave. Dulos. You have to be their waiter. You have to wait on them, diaconus. And then after they give you the things that you want, spiritual power, spiritual knowledge, spiritual wisdom, divination, whatever it is, then you got to pay it back. It's a credit system. Familiar spirits work on a credit system. you got to have your credit card to pay them back. It's pain. It's misery. Serving Satan, serving familiar spirits will give you a lifetime of pain in your later years. You'll be just like one of these broken down, busted up psychics in their 60s or 70s. Severe arthritis, severe fibromyalgia, terminal illnesses organ diseases. It's awful. It is absolutely awful. Familiar spirits are the worst demons of all.
extremely bright, bright, and extremely powerful, and extremely deadly. Your job is to be a diaconess, a waiter. Yeah, you're to be a slave, a doulos, and a waiter for the Lord Jesus. And we are to be as our master. That's our goal, to be to be like Jesus. That's our goal. We never fully make that goal, okay? It's not possible. It's not possible. Years and years ago, decades ago, a man named Bob Beeman set a long jump record at the Olympics that nobody could believe. It was a day uh, that Bob Beeman uh, woke up and he was a freak. The guy was a complete freak. Have you ever uh, heard the saying, you know, I'm having a good day? Everybody has heard that, and that has happened to everybody. You know, some days you get up and you can't miss. I mean, you're hitting on all cylinders. Everything's going right. Could be anything, athletics, business, family. It doesn't, some days, doesn't happen often, unfortunately, but some days you, you can't lose. You cannot lose. Well, Bob Beeman woke up in 1968, and this guy had one of those days, a day of a lifetime, a generational day. This guy woke up a superhuman freak, a superhuman freak. And uh, he won the gold medal in the long jump with a, with a jump nobody could believe. Nobody could believe. It was similar in basketball to when Wilt Chamberlain came into the league after he had played basketball at the University of Kansas. He came into the NBA, and his skills were so much greater than everybody else's. They had to change the league and the rules of the league to accommodate. Well, Bob Beeman had a Wilt Chamberlain day. Uh, Wilt used to have him almost every day of his life. This guy had it one day. And he hit it like nobody could believe. And that record lasted for decades, but that record was eventually broken. Somebody, decades later, with better training, better nutrition, probably better steroids, better everything than Bob Beeman had back in the 60s, out jumped him by a few inches. It finally happened decades later. Well, you and I will never experience that. That is never going to happen. And God does not require you to be just like Jesus. That's not required by God. You can't live a sinless life. Okay? You can't do everything exactly right. But that's not the purpose of it. A slave is not a perfect person. A diaconess, a waiter, is not a perfect person. And that's where the grace of God and the love of God comes in to cover the things about you that are not like exactly like Jesus. Okay? I can't pray like him. I don't have a fraction of his anointing. I don't, I can't love like him. I can't do all these things, but our goal is to have the mind of Christ. Our goal is to think like him. Our goal is to be like him. And that's what God wants you to do. He wants you to continually press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And you, you do that Already knowing, like Paul said, I know I haven't arrived yet. I know I'm not there yet. I know I'm not doing everything perfectly yet. But this one thing I do, I forget those things which are behind me, and I reach for those things that are before me. I reach for the prize, the high calling of God. Now listen, the Apostle Paul was the greatest Christian ever lived. 
Okay, there's nobody, nobody greater than him. He was the number one apostle. To this day, 2,000 years later, no one's ever come close to the apostle Paul. If he wasn't exactly like Jesus, what chance would you and I have? We would have none. It's not going to happen. Okay? But it doesn't have to happen. It doesn't have to happen. You can be a slave. You can have enormous anointings, enormous giftings. You can be a powerhouse for God and not be perfect. And God does not require you to be perfect. See, your goal is to be as your master. You will never be above your master. And I wanted that to be an encouraging message for you because that's what God is telling you. You are to be a clump of clay gradually molded over time on your way to being exactly like Jesus, but will never actually make it to be exactly like him. And we are not required to be exactly like him. Because if we were, no no one would make it. And you and I wouldn't be here today. That's where grace and love and mercy step in to make up that imperfection gap. I'm here and perfection's up here and there's a gap between us and that gap is filled with love, grace, mercy, trust, faith, and above all, patience. You must have patience to make it because if you decide to become a doulos or a di diaconus, a slave and a waiter for Christ, the first person that's going to notice it is the devil. And you are going to have to have faith and love and patience to overcome the adversity you're going to get. If you don't do anything for Christ, and you never get involved in the moving of the Spirit, your adversity is going to be very low. Nobody's really going to care. You're not going to get attacked. But did you happen to notice that everyone in the New Testament who ministered in the Spirit, starting with Jesus, the attacks didn't come until after the Holy Ghost started moving. Did you happen to notice that? Paul, Peter. Peter never got attacked by the scribes and Pharisees when he was working as a fisherman. John didn't either. Jesus never got attacked while making uh, tabletops or chairs with his dad, getting trained on how to be a laborer and working. And no, nobody ever attacked him. Do you, do you know when hell came to breakfast for Jesus? After he got filled with the Holy Ghost and he came back from the desert, it says he returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And then when the Holy Ghost started moving, that's when the devil ramped up his attacks. So if you want to be a slave and you want to be a waiter and a servant for the Lord, you're going to get attacked. There isn't any way to get out of it. It's going to happen. You can avoid it by doing nothing and being self-absorbed and living for yourself. No problem. You're not going to get attacked doing natural human things, you know, going to work, taking care of your family, um, eating dinner, all the things we do as a regular person. You're not going to have to face huge spiritual monstrous attacks doing those normal things. But if you move over into the moving of the spirit and you start seeing people healed or delivered from demons, or you start 
preaching in the power of the Holy Ghost like John the Baptist, preaching a real truth against sin and against rebellion and against witchcraft and against sorcery. If you start preaching those things, somebody's going to hear you do it. And that somebody's going to be the devil. And he's going to come looking for you. And that's why as a slave and a waiter and as a servant, you will have been patient. You will have studied the word. You will have renewed your mind. And you will be an overcoming comer because of nothing the devil can do or take from you unless you allow it. And so from this day forward, I want you to remember that you are not, not a self-absorbed person. You don't wake up in the morning looking to live for yourself, and you don't go to bed at night looking for yourself. You are a doulos. You are a diaconess. You are a servant of the Most High God. And uh, in your next life, in your next life, your rewards and your authority and your blessings are going to be so incomprehensible that our minds now cannot comprehend that what's going to happen. It's going to be so great. But if you sacrifice now, your rewards are so great later. It's amazing. It happened to Jesus. He lived the life of a servant and a slave to Father. And now, Jesus said, everything Father has is mine. God gave Jesus everything. <laughs> everything. He got everything. All of it. And in exchange for that, Jesus gave Father the only thing he ever really wanted. And that is you. And you know when he does it for the last time? At the marriage supper of the Lamb. That is the graduation ceremony where the Lord Jesus takes us and hands them formally and officially to Father. And that was the only thing Father ever really wanted was you. And Jesus said, anyone who serves me and is my slave and my diaconess, my waiter, will be, him will my father honor. Because father's greatest joy in life that warms his heart is seeing you serving the son. And God did not have everything, did he? No. He had almost everything. Universe, universes, galaxies, everything, you know. God is sovereign. Everything's his. But he didn't have everything. He didn't have you. And that was the thing he really wanted. You. Uh, mean more to Father than all the galaxies um, the Webb telescope sees now. All those galaxies, none of them are as important to Father as you are. And so your goal in life now is to become a slave. Slavery is wonderful. You used to be a slave to sin. That's not true anymore. Now you're a slave to the Holy Ghost and the Lord Jesus. And if you do that, him will my father honor. You can't lose. You're not going to lose. I love you.